Hello, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, at today's webinar. My name is uh, Samir Amari. I'm the head of uh, business development and marketing at Afridi and Angel. Uh, our speaker today is Shahram Safai. And before I turn over to Shahram, I want to remind you to submit your questions in the Q&A throughout the, the webinar. Uh, we will uh, uh, do our best to have our discussion and uh, answer all the questions um, during the webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded and a recording will be posted on our website next week and will be shared with all of you. Thank you again for joining us and uh, over to you, Shahram. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk to you. Always good to connect uh, with friends, clients, contacts, and talk about real estate. So today's topic is UAE real estate update and recent developments. And we'll be talking about 2022 and 2023 and what we believe the future holds and the uh, legal updates that have occurred. Let's uh, move on, please. Next slide. Quickly about uh, us, uh, we've been here since 1975. We're one of the most established firms in the country. We're licensed in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, and the DIFC. And we're a full service law firm with corporate commercial as well as litigation. Uh, we advise on a lot of cross-border work as well as uh, local work in the UAE uh, and the region, the MENA region. Uh, so uh, we, we look forward to being of assistance uh, to you. Next slide, please. So let's start off by talking about the market. I'm sure that all of you have noticed what's been happening with the market. Uh, it's been an incredible uh, year, year and a half. The real estate market has boomed significantly. And the question is, what is this boom attributable to? And uh, of course, there's factors that are obvious, but let's talk about what we see. We think that COVID really was a, was a big accelerant of what, was, uh, what is happening now. Uh, this country, and specifically Dubai, dealt very well with COVID. They handled the situation well. Vaccines were available. Um, closing of businesses and others were, were minimal. And it was handled uh, extremely well on a global scale when you ranked it. And so that attracted a lot of people to come here, specifically from Europe. Uh, as well as other jurisdictions. So that, that was certainly one attraction from a safety and handleability perspective of that pandemic. But also there were others, specifically from Europe, I would say, that came here because of the tax situation. So COVID resulted in government expenditures uh, on the pandemic and, and keeping people safe, et cetera. But that resulted in taxes increasing to pay for it. And people did not want to be part of that. Uh, and some some came here, so you know parties that we call lovingly tax refugees uh, moved here from different jurisdictions to escape that increased taxation. So that was certainly one factor that led to the increase in interest in Dubai real estate, as well as um, uh, general UAE real estate. The second factor, of course, is what you all know is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. That conflict uh, resulted in the exodus of Russians, Russian businesses, uh, and others, as well as from Ukraine into this jurisdiction. And that resulted in, and it, it continues to result in, an increase in property prices. And probably the most recent wave that I'm sure you're aware of, of are the Chinese expats, business from China. China opened up um, that, that process, and so certain funds can now be uh, withdrawn and brought over and, and uh, invested in. So the Chinese wave is also assisting in the increase in property prices, as well as other factors. But these are certainly three main factors that have contributed to the increase. On the other side of the ledger, which I think a lot of people may not be thinking about because Dubai appears to be doing so well, prices have really gone up through the stratosphere, uh, is what may happen to property prices going forward. As you know, globally, people have been talking about uh, a recession, a global recession, uh, really the knock-on effect from COVID and the expenditure, et cetera. Now we have ri rising inflation, significantly uh, high inflation, as well as high interest rates. 
resulting in uh, what people predict to be a recession, companies laying off, taking reserves in their finances, et cetera. And that anticipation may result in actions here where uh, purchasers may hold off on purchasing, may try to negotiate, uh, and a reduction in demand, if you like, which then could uh, result in a reduction in prices. Uh, and that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, is it happening now? Has it happened? I leave that to the experts. But I will talk about the phenomenon that could happen uh, if a global recession is something that comes to realization, and then there's a knock-on effect on Dubai. So that's an overview of how um, the market uh, has been uh, and what it's going to be going forward. In the Dubai real estate market right now, 2022, was a bumper year in regard to real estate transactions. And so our record uh, $65 billion worth of transactions conducted, which is an increase of about 61% from 2021. So really right through the strategy. It's been trem a tremendous, tremendous market. While property prices have fallen throughout the rest of the world, overall pro property price growth in Dubai climbed by about 10% in 2022. Average property price for villas in 2022 rose by about 13%. In some areas, those villas have gone up by 60, 70, 80, 100%. It, it really has been a significant, significant rise in, in prices in, in certain areas. And overall, as an average, you can see by 13%. So uh, average property prices for apartments also rose, not as much, but still quite significant by 9%. Of course, more luxury apartments, uh, apartments with water views, uh, oceanfront, uh, waterfront, et cetera. Uh, are more desirable and have gone up even more. So that's a sense of what's happened here. It's a sense of the price increases uh, in 2022 uh, and continuing into the beginning of 2023. Next slide, please. Now, on the rental side, there's also been uh, an increase as there would be. when property prices go up, um, people cannot afford to buy perhaps or are holding off to see if it will drop they will uh, increasingly try to rent. That drives up rental prices as well. So sharp increase in average uh, asking rents for villas, 24%, apartments 27%, uh, with uh, the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine and expanding visa options and other factors that we've discussed uh, have been the driving factors for these increased rents. And with the shortage of availability in respect to residential villas, we've seen annual rents rise to about 282,000 germs. It is not uncommon now to hear about very desirable areas, uh, villa developments having a rent of a million germs. That was unheard of, uh, you know, uh, five years ago, eight years ago. So there's been a significant increase in rental prices as well. This surge in rental prices to increase migration to Dubai has also seen an increase in rental disputes as landlords attempt to raise rents during the course of tenancy. So we see, we have seen, and we are handling uh disputes go up and that will continue to the extent that this trend continues now i mentioned to you that uh, uh th there's been tremendous growth and uh, uh villas have been put on the market with respect to that uh, as of today for example i'll give you today's news um mohammed bin rashid city uh has uh, got the next phase of the villas which they've launched and they're saying that that's going to be bigger villas better quality, et cetera. And so that's one example of a developer uh, getting on the bandwagon and, and uh, uh, basically doing a release uh, to take advantage of the market. Palm Jebel Ali is the next uh, launch that's going to occur. People have been waiting for that. This is Palm Jebel Ali 2.0. Palm Jebel Ali was already launched in the mid 2000s. It was sold out to, to a great extent and uh, it was never uh, delivered, and then it was canceled in its own way, and now this is 2.0, the revival of Palm Jebel Ali, which is significantly larger than Palm Jumeirah, and so uh, watch out for, the, for that project specifically, and there's many others. These are just the two that I came across today in, in dealings, so that's a little bit about the market and what, what has happened. Moving on and talking about the state of the economy, uh, next slide, please. So as everyone knows, higher interest rates are anticipated to slow property prices 
as we move through 2023. This is the economic expectation. Um, this uh, goes hand in hand with the recession. So the higher interest rates are designed to slow down the economy. A slowdown of economy generally has an effect on real estate prices. This will be tempered by the preference for cash purchases in this jurisdiction, which decreases exposure to Dubai markets. So Dubai, there are a lot of cash purchasers, uh, not you and I, you know, we will get mortgages, but there are a lot of cash purchasers uh, that we've heard of. And so <clears throat> maybe the effect won't be as much, but certainly there will, there will be an effect when it comes to uh, the Dubai market. International downturns and international economies may motivate potential investors to buy their time before committing further in 2023 in the hopes that property prices drop. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> All right, so let's move on and talk about some new laws. There's Dubai Decree number 23 of 2022. This new law really is about Musata rights. Musata rights are rights to build on a plot of land and use it. It doesn't mean that you can own it. So the previous position was in Article 353, uh, 1353 to 1360 of the UAE Civil Code. It allowed someone to uh, obtain Musata rights, to get them from the landowner, but it didn't set or approve any form of agreement. It didn't have a formal role for the land department, although you always have to register it by law, and no explicit registration right, <clears throat> and no explicit obligations imposed on the holder of such a right. So that position has been slightly amended now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the new regime for granting and registration of Musata rights um, gets into uh, Musata rights much more. This is Decree 23 of 2022. It grants an enhanced role to the Dubai Land Department in the issuance of a standard form agreement that is to be implemented and the responsibility of identifying the suitable plots of land which should be utilized for the purpose. Implements a strict requirement to register the Masata right. That was always there under law, but it's, it's codifying it now officially and imposes the obligation uh, for that, for the registration on the right holder. It sets the maximum initial term to 35 years, which can be extended to 50 years. Traditionally, everyone's understood Musata rights to have a maximum of 50 years. And traditionally, when we do the agreements, we have a right to extend for a further 50. Here, they're setting the initial maximum to 35 years and then allowing extension to 50 years with a grantor's approval. So this is the first interesting law uh, of, uh, of the recent past that we want to discuss with you, this Dubai Decree number 23 of 2022 on Musata rights. No, it's not a right of ownership, it's a right of use and development on the land. And I think we're going to see Musata rights become more popular as people may not want to buy the land, but simply get permission to come on the land and use it for whatever purpose for 50 years and then move, move on for 50 years plus another 49 or 50 years, which is a significant enough time to obtain the economic rights. So we're gonna see more sophisticated real estate transactions and structuring as the values go up and other types of rights besides just ownership become of interest to uh, investors. Uh, let's move on to the next law that is exciting and interesting to know about. That's circular number five of 2022. So, before we get into this, let's, um, let's talk about some history, which is FATF, uh, Federal uh, Task Force for Enforcement Effectively uh, and Rating of Countries when it comes to transparency and money laundering issues and anti-money laundering provisions. And so that task force, which is out of Paris, rates countries globally as to how well they're doing in dealing with regulations and enforcement when it comes to uh, money laundering, their laws and procedures. And we had been uh, for a long time uh, doing well in that on the green list, but recently we were downgraded to the gray list, which uh, we were not happy about. And so the country has taken certain measures or significant measures of laws and offices and procedures to deal with that. This is, the consequence and part of that package to deal with 
money laundering. And so we'll, we'll take a read of it. So one of the, one of the uh, primary places where money laundering does occur is real estate. And the government's aware of that. So this is one of the uh, circulars that is meant to deal with that. So uh, in these circumstances under circular five of 2022, money laundering is an issue where the purchase price for a property is in excess of 55,000 dirhams and transactions being financed either partially or fully through cash. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, every real estate purchase price is above 55,000 dirhams. But really what they mean here is if you are paying a cash for a real estate transaction more than 55,000 dirhams. So imagine that you have a real estate transaction of a million dirhams and you, um, you, you know, instead of, instead of just paying it all through a, a transfer through the bank, you actually paying cash as in physical cash in a, in a briefcase. And that happens to be more than 55,000 dirhams, that physical, that physical cash that you're handing over. Then it is something of interest under the circular. So it's about cash payments of 55,000 dirhams or more uh, physical paper cash in your hand handed over to someone else. That's the first uh, point of interest. The second is where uh, either part or all the purchase price for the property is made up of a virtual asset. By virtual asset, they mean uh, many things, but actually they're talking about crypto. That is the issue of concern. Where crypto has been identified as something that could be used for money laundering and therefore it is something of interest. And so that's the second item of interest under circular five of 22. Not that it's illegal, just like 55,000 dirhams or more is not illegal, it's of interest and we'll find out what that means. The third item of interest under circular five of 2022 is where either part or all of the purchase price of the property is being financed through a converted virtual asset. What does that mean? That means someone sold the crypto, they sold Bitcoin, the cash came into their bank account, then they use that cash to pay. So uh, to summarize, if you're paying uh, for property with cash of more than 55,000, if you are paying for property with crypto, either partly or fully, if you're paying for property with the bank transfers or otherwise, but those funds came from the sale of crypto or the financing somehow, of crypto. And I use crypto, uh, cryptocurrency as the example for a virtual asset. In these three cases, next slide, please. Then in these cases, um, real estate professionals, generally referring to brokers, but it could be others, it could even be law firms, have to do the following. They have to obtain copies of identification documents belonging to the party, transferring the funds, number one. Number two, they have to obtain receipts, invoices, and contracts relating to the transaction. And I think you're thinking to yourself, well, we would do that anyway, whether it's cash or not cash or crypto or not crypto. We would get identification documents, copy of your passport, copy of Emirates ID, et cetera. We would give receipts, we would invoices, contracts, we'd get copies. So one and two are not the issue. It's the third one that is the important one. And that is to submit a transaction report via the Financial Intelligence Unit's Go AML platform for the central bank. So you would have to get the identification documents. You would get the copies of the receipts and most contracts. And then you would submit a transaction report if it's crypto that's being used or funds that came from crypto or it is more than 55,000 dirhams in cash. So that is the importance of Circular 5 of 2022. It affects tra transactions here and every uh, broker and other uh, professional, including lawyers, have to be, has to be aware of the circuit. Next slide, please. So the next law that we wanna talk about, which has been interesting uh, in Dubai, is Dubai Decree number 22 of 2022. This is about property investment funds, uh, typically formed in ADGM, or in the DIFC. And the previous position regarding property investment funds in Dubai has been the following. It generally has not been a commonly chosen investment vehicle. People have generally not used funds. It uh, takes more time, legal fees, expenses, et cetera, to set up. So why would I do it when I can invest myself or I can invest through a company or an SBV 
uh, you know, uh, offshore company, et cetera. But now th that has been the traditional issue. The attraction of property transfer fees uh, when you change investors in a fund has been a problem. The restrictive regulations applied to regulatory authorities responsible for overseeing the fund. So regulations, red tape, uh, fees when uh, fund shareholders change, this and the cost really have really prevented people from using property investment funds. But that's changed now and you'll see why. Because Dubai decree number 22 of 2022 is giving certain privileges to encourage uh, the use of investment funds. Next slide, please. So now uh, under this decree, the Dubai government has told us that uh, Dubai Land Department property transfer fees will not be apply applied in relation to properties owned by a property investment fund in the event of a change in shareholding. That is huge, that is huge. So what they're telling us is you can form a property investment fund, you can have shareholders, though, and it can then, that property investment fund can own property underneath it, one or several. And if there's a change in shareholding, you do not pay uh, transfer fees. That is a significant, significant change. So to encourage you to set up these funds in the DIC or ADGM and to use them to own property. Um, also, the right to own property or acquire usufruct right is specifically uh, identified areas where foreign nationals are usually not permitted to own property. So the second privilege they're giving you is to say, we will allow you to buy property, own it, or have a usufruct or a right to use the property, Mosata or otherwise, I guess, different types of rights, uh, in areas that are not freehold areas. So for example, in Jumeirah 1, they might identify certain areas where you, the fund, can only can purchase, or in Deira, or in Murdiff, in areas um, where, where, where there may not be that much or any of freehold areas, if you have a fund, they will allow funds specifically that qualify to purchase in those specific areas. So that's a significant uh, privilege that's being granted if you have a property investment fund. And then thirdly, look at this third privilege, which is also very exciting, a reduction in the transfer fees that the Dubai Land Department charges you from 4% to 2%. It is a significant, significant saving, saving of 50% on transfer fees. When you combine these three privileges, it really makes a very good case for uh, setting up a fund and buying uh, property through those funds with as a collective investment scheme for investors. So that is a very exciting decree. Next decree. Well, the next decree for the next one, we travel to Sharjah and we talk about what's happening in Sharjah. I was... Uh, in Sharjah Invest uh, Forum, Investment Forum yesterday. Uh, and for the opening of that forum, Sharjah is opening up its uh, approach to foreign investors and it's always been an excellent uh, area to invest, but it hasn't quite kept up with the speed and the pace of Dubai. And it's really trying to do that. The Investment Forum uh, signaled that and phenomenal things are coming from there. Arada is a developer and others are doing fantastic projects there similar and on par with Dubai. I would encourage you to look at that. And Sharjah Law 22 of 2022 really um, uh, shows uh, that position for real estate. So it extended property rights to foreign nationals. Let's look at the previous position under the old law in Sharjah. Under the old law, the law five of 20, 2010, foreign nationals were not permitted to own property on a freehold basis. Foreigners, expats, uh, ownership rights were limited only to the right to hold their usufruct over property for a maximum of 10 years, equivalent to a use right or a lease right, uh, something like that. So it was quite limited and that really restricted the market and interest in the market in Sharjah. Then that was changed significantly uh, in law two of 2022, where foreign nationals are now permitted to own property on a freehold basis with specific, within specific areas by the Sharjah Executive Council. A very similar legal position to Dubai, effectively saying foreigners can now own in freehold areas in Sharjah, and those freehold areas will be determined by the government of Sharjah. That's the exact same position in Dubai, where foreigners can own in freehold areas as approved by the Dubai government. So that is a significant change, a significant improvement, and very interesting for a foreign investor. Next slide, please. So the key points to note 
about Sharjah law number two of 22. And please keep a very close eye on Sharjah. It is a phenomenal area. It used to be the economic center many, many years ago in the 1970s and, and slightly into the 80s. That changed and Dubai took over, but they're trying, to, uh, trying their best to move forward again. So key points to note, the specific areas and projects have yet to be identified by the council, but they will be just as they were in Dubai. Uh, in the early 2000s, some were not clear, but then they became clear and they, they issued the list. I would expect Sharjah will do exactly the same. And the extensive legal framework that protects foreign investors that's in place in Dubai uh, is not fully developed yet in Sharjah. So there's, there's increased risk for foreigners, but that will be developed. Uh, we're quite confident that with time that should come into place. And so Sharjah is a very attractive uh, market to look at for those who uh, are into uh, those kind of developing markets. As an example, uh, a five bedroom villa that may sell for about 12 million dirhams in, excuse me, um, allergies, uh, in uh, Jumeirah Gulf Estates. That five bedroom villa, if relocated to Sharjah, perhaps right on the border with Dubai, would sell for about 5 million. And so the savings are significant, especially if someone wants to use it as, uh, as their own home. And with that, uh, that concludes uh, our presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sharam. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a question came through earlier, uh, not much earlier, but it, it's in regards to the fund vehicle. Um, uh, does the fund vehicle only pay 2% while buying a property instead of four? Uh, trustee offices still charge four. Uh, that's right. It pays only 2%. That's the attra attraction. Uh, trustee char uh, offices charge 4%, but that will be reduced to 2% once you have that qualifying fund. Um, and we can certainly assist with setting up the fund and making sure that qualification is there uh, for the 2%. That is a significant savings uh, on, on a large project. Imagine a project of, you know, uh, 50 million dirhams or, you know, uh, higher that's a significant, significant savings, even lower amounts. It, it, is, it is tremendous. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, a few questions came through. I'm just gonna try and go through all of them. Uh, sure. So you've discussed a, a, a number of legal developments that have taken place over the last year. Which in your view is the most important? Well, um, you know, I, I, you know, my, I sit in Dubai, and so I'm very Dubai-centric. But I have to tell you, I'm very excited about what's happening in Sharjah. Um, you know, they are, after years, they've really turned their mind to development. Uh, they've got technology parks. They've got research and development. They always were the industrial headquarters uh, of, of the country with lots of manufacturing and skills and spare parts, etc., but now these developments going on and Arada, which is a quasi-government company uh, related to the Sharjah government has these phenomenal developments that they're planning. I've seen the master plans. So I would encourage people to look at Sharjah and look at the potential that it offers. So I, I found that uh, when I saw that law, I was very excited. That was probably the one that caused me the most excitement uh, out of the ones we've discussed. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, as it is predicted that the Dubai real estate market may suffer a slowdown due to uh, investors hedging their bets against the market, what are some ways in which investors can be enticed to continue to invest in the market? So, you know, I've really talked about this for a long time and I continue to be a proponent of, of openness and transparency and information for investors and the public. And so, I believe that um, the government can take steps, further steps uh, to provide more information, more access to information to investors, uh, to provide more incentives for them to invest in Dubai. Um, and that will help to attract more, more investment in investors, the more transparency and openness. But also I think one of the aspects that is important when it comes to real estate is that laws as are written should be enforced. And so one of the things that we saw in the crash of 2008 was that laws had just been introduced. And as a result of those laws, just being introduced in 2007, 2008, 
they, there was not a chance practically to have them implement it. And so, for example, trust accounts for off-plan property had not been properly um, funded because the, the law had just been brought in. And by the time they got around to trying to fund them, the crash happened and it was too late and the funds were not in the trust account and there were no funds to be had. Uh, we may have similar situation now for different reasons. And so I would, um, I would, from my desire, is that laws are fully uh, abided by and implemented so that we can have uh, increased investor protection. Um, and if we do have increased investor protection, if we can demonstrate that uh, by objective standards, by the standards of the uh, global rankings and make sure that we are getting closer and closer to the top tier, then we will attract the best of investors. We will attract pension funds, uh, REITs, and many other stable uh, investors where they will stabilize uh, the market and increase prices on a regular um, scale uh, where we're not subject to the boom and bust cycles that we've experienced. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, uh, another question, are you seeing more property funds being formed in the DIFC or ADGM? Um, I think the property fund, um, the property fund activity is, is, is going forward. Um, the ADGM seeing more attraction uh, than DIFC, generally speaking. I suspect the Dubai government will try to incentivize more DIFC fund formation because it is a local product as opposed to Abu Dhabi. But the ADGM has tended to be more popular in the recent past. That wasn't the case before, uh, but that, that's what we've seen with the ADGM more recently. That may change in the future. Okay. Um, uh, this is in relation to service charges. Uh, are there any developments for recovery of service charges from owners who do not pay in the owner's association? Yes, significant developments. Uh, there was, as you recall, an old law, which was the jointly owned property law of 2007. That was a flawed law to begin with. Uh, and many people advised the government uh, of that. Uh, that law was effectively not implemented and a different scheme was actually run in parallel uh, by the government for many years until 2019. In 2019, the government brought a new law uh, to deal with common property, jointly owned property. And that is the law that is in place now. That law contains a lot of teeth when it comes to service charges, enforcement, and recovery, being able to uh, go to court, get an order to um, uh, auction that property to get your service charges back. And there's many cases of that that are in the courts now. So the position on the enforcement of service charges has changed significantly since 2019. Of course, it took a while for that law to be implemented again because of COVID, but after that, it, it has been, <coughs> excuse me, and um, it's, it's a very effective law. And so uh, service charges, enforcement, recovery um, are doing much better, much, much better than under the old law. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, this question is uh, back to um, uh, reporting on the reporting the, uh, it's, does the, 55,000 cash payment threshold for filing a transaction report apply to cash payments for rent and or lease, or does it only apply for purchase transactions? Um, I, I would say, I'll just have a quick look at that. I haven't looked at it really from a lease perspective, but I would, I would probably say that it applies to both. It's a, it's a money laundering issue. And so, um, let's see. No, I think what I'm looking at it now, it says purchase price. So that's a good question. It's a good question. Based on, and I, I don't have the law in front of me now, but based on my notes, it says purchase price. So it may not ap uh, apply to leases. I'm not sure why it wouldn't though. If I was doing money laundering, it really should. Uh, but I can, uh, if you follow up with me, Personally, through my email, I can clarify that for you more. Uh, my notes and presentation say purchase price, uh, but honestly, if it's a money laundering issue, it should apply to any real estate transactions, including whether it's a regular lease or a Mossata or otherwise. 
Okay, okay, thank you. Um, this is just, a, 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 I guess, your opinion. Do you foresee more mortgages defaults uh, with the rise of interest rates? Well, I think uh, my answer to that would be the, you know, the economist answer, which is yes. Uh, and that's the theoretical answer. As interest rates go up, uh, people may have variable rate mortgages. Those will become unaffordable and uh, they will default. Um, as interest rates go up, people may have even fixed uh, mortgages, but those interest rates impact on consumer prices and other things, increasing the burden on the consumer and therefore the default on even a fixed uh, rate mortgage. So talking just purely theoretically, unfortunately, I do anticipate that will happen, yes. Okay. Um, with respect to uh, uh, transparency by developers, are there laws around how transparent the developers have to be with the buyers? Uh, especially, you know, the, the, the question says there's smaller developers, there's a lot of blocking the units to create artificial demand. Yes. So, well, let's talk about the, the first thing came to my mind when you asked that question was about disclosure and the disclosure document that is attached to the sale and purchase agreement regarding when it has to be completed, what the, um, <coughs> excuse me, what the finishes are, and many other details on service charges, et cetera. So that, that's a very good start as to what unit is being purchased off plan and, and to have a full disclosure being called the disclosure letter. Uh, so, so that's a good start. However, what, what the question goes to is developers who are perhaps not acting in good faith. And yes, of course there are laws. There are general laws, the civil code, there's penal code with criminal laws. And there is the developer and the obligations it has under its trade license uh, and, and other obligations that, that will exist under law where a case could be made against them. Uh, but, you know, you'd have to identify what the facts are and what, if what they're doing is impacting you, causing you damage. You have to be willing to actually complain about that and put in the time and the money to do so, whether to the government or in a court. So it is possible. But you know, you'd have to be willing to to do that, and so uh, it's just a question of whether uh, you'd want to do that. As far as the government's concerned, I would say, if that's happening, you need to bring it to the government's attention. Who are we talking about in Dubai? We're talking about Rira. Please feel free to visit Rira, to email them or call them, and give them your concerns. Uh, they are very interested in these types of practices, and they I know that they work hard to try and prevent them. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, going back to the reporting requirements, uh, what is the motivation behind the, the new reporting requirements for specific real estate transactions? Right, so the motivation is that uh, it is, is to, <laughs> excuse me, to stop money laundering. Uh, real estate traditionally, all over the world, not Dubai, everyone knows that real estate is one of the primary mechan mechanisms to wash money. If I have money that is money of, uh, you know, from criminal proceeds, whatever that crime may be, I will take that money. Now I, I need to make that money legitimate. How do I do that? There's various mechanisms, but real estate's the classic one, where I take that money and I give it to a, to a seller and they gave me an asset in return, a house, a villa, an apartment, apartment building. And then I sell that in a few years. By doing that, I've now washed my money. And so real estate, uh, is used uh, in, in many, many jurisdictions all around the world to wash uh, dirty money and make it clean, whether uh, quickly or over time, or to store your money. And that's also that storage of money is also clean money. And so that is also an effect. So that the motivation is to tackle that to the extent it's occurring in, in Dubai and to, uh, to handle that from an anti-money laundering uh, law. As I said, there's an there's a international task force that ranks countries based on their transparency and dealings with anti-money laundering. And we had done very well in that as the UAE. We dropped down and we want to get back up there into the green, into the green list again. Okay, um, uh, we've got just time for one last question. Um, in relation to the UAE Dubai real estate market, uh, what are you most excited about 
when looking into the future. The Dubai real estate market. Well, I'm I'm very excited, and and if you're not excited, you should be. Uh, you know, just look around you. Look at what's happened. Look at what's happened in the past five years. You know, our growth rate and what we've been able to achieve as a city has been linear. I would say aligned uh, up to about you know. 2015, 2016. Then we started to change that from a line to a curve that curves up an exponential growth. Look at the growth that has happened, the beaches that have been built in Maras and JBR, what has happened in the Palm, all the developments, the hotels, the entertainment. It, this city has become world-class from a touristic and entertainment and livability perspective. That's attracting global players, global money, uh, funds, et cetera. Of course, not to the level that I would like. I would still like to see much more, but it's become incredible. And so I'm very excited that we have moved on to the next stage. You know, we've, we've shed a certain skin. We've got a new skin on now. We're more sophisticated, we're better. And Dubai is just going from strength to strength. And so I think we're gonna see another metamorphosis, another change coming. As Dubai continues, it's uh, change and improvement. It's always evolving uh, in the next few years. So keep an eye on that space and make sure you are part of it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shaham. And thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, ses the session is recorded and it will be posted on our website and shared with all of you. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Shahram directly afterwards. And uh, we hope to see you uh, our, our last session of this series is tomorrow at 11 a.m. I don't know if you've uh, registered for it and uh, hope to see you again tomorrow and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. And, yeah, thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.